Hey, welcome to another Coaching You podcast with the coach, Brendan Sir. So excited for a special edition podcast today uh, with the great Nate Oates, the University of Alabama head coach uh, at the Final Four a few weeks ago in New Orleans. So uh, we were in our annual Next Gen Coaches Forum in partnership with Fast Model. And uh, another great, great event. And Nate Oates was, as he always is, I find one of the most fascinating coaches there is in college basketball. He's very bright. He loves analytics. His team plays at an incredible fast pace. Uh, they play hard as heck. Uh, and he's really brought uh, a fast, fun basketball style to Tuscaloosa uh, to complement a great football program. So I think, you know, you're going to, but what I love about Nate Oates is who he was, who he is. He was a high school math teacher that got, became, after 11 years, a terrific assistant coach at the University of Buffalo under Bobby Hurley. And then, you know, got an opportunity after having phenomenal seasons to have the University of Alabama pursue him and basically convince him to come down and participate in SEC basketball which is one of the highest rated conferences in the world. And I, the thing I love about him is that he's so personable. He has great relationship skills, but as I emphasized before, you'll see that he loves culture and culture is really one of the key words in coaching nowadays. And I think you're really going to enjoy the way Nate teaches it and discusses it with me at our coaches forum in New Orleans. Now, if you like Nate's, what he's saying, and you want the other three speakers that we had there, go into our uh, new Coaching You Plus. That's Coaching You Plus, P L U S dot com. And you can simply join our for $7.99 a month. Just go in there and you'll be able to get everything we have in there, including these four coaches. So after this quick timeout from our tremendous partners and sponsors, we're going to be back with Nate Oates, the head coach at the University of Alabama. I'm so excited to announce our new partner, Instat. Instat is a powerful web-based platform which enables you to store, edit, and share video linked to statistics. Their video database contains over 30,000 player profiles and nearly 7,000 team profiles. Thousands of basketball games from all over the world are uploaded daily, with many of them filmed exclusively by Instat. Instat's user-friendly interface is very intuitive. The flexible filtering system will fit the needs of coaches at all levels. You can sort through specific play types, locations on the court, lineups, and various other parameters. The Instat system contains multiple tools that clients from all over the world utilize for scouting, recruiting, coaching and player development, video editing, and tagging. They also take an individual approach to each client. The wide network of Instat account representatives allow Instat to best serve their clients 24-7. Also, Instat production specialists will provide you with a quick and precise breakdowns of your team and opponents in less than 10 hours. Need a certain game ready sooner? Instat gives you the ability to prioritize the specific games you want the data for first. Instat also provides free individual player access. So feel free to invite your players to the Instat platform so they can access their page, follow their performance, scout opponents, and share clips with other players and coaches. After each game, they can receive an individual one-page PDF report and video clips with all box score statistics. For more details, please visit our official website, instatsport.com forward slash basketball and apply for a free one month trial using code coaching you live. Again, that code is coaching you live. Contact Eric Stang at eric.stang at instatsport.com for more information on this offer as well. And that's E-R-I-C period S-T-A-N-G at I-N-S-T-A-T sport dot com or click the link in our show notes. 
We're thrilled to have our longtime partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball on board as sponsors of the Coaching You podcast. Dr. Dish machines are undoubtedly the most user-friendly and advanced machines in the world of basketball today. Dr. Dish has completely revolutionized and reimagined the shooting machine to provide the best solution on the market. Join top programs around the world like Duke, North Carolina, Florida, and countless others and upgrade your shooting machine to Dr. Dish. Dr. Dish machines are the best way to increase purposeful reps in your program to get players better, faster, while tracking progress along the way. Dr. Dish provides so much more than just your standard shooting machines with custom training, pro trainers, and coaches on demand, real-time and detailed analytics, and top-of-the-line drills and workouts. If you're looking to take your program to the next level, look no further than Dr. Dish for the best basketball training machine in the world. If you have an old machine that's just collecting dust in your gym, did you know that you can trade that into Dr. Dish for up to $1,500 off and get a new dish? Make sure to give our friends at Dr. Dish a follow at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter and Instagram for great daily drills, workouts, tips, and inspiration. Or contact us at drdishbasketball.com. Don't forget to mention Coaching You or our podcast for $300 off your purchase. My dear friend, Nate Oates, the head coach of the University of Alabama is here. Let's give Nate a warm welcome. Thank you, brother. Thanks, Brennan. So Nate is very special to me and because he, he came, my second hometown is Detroit, Michigan. I'm a Jersey guy, but I, I prefer Detroit as my real second hometown, because we won a lot of games there. And, uh, and so they still like me there. So, uh, you know, so I love Detroit. And when Nate really got it, started in coaching, you became a high school coach at Romulus High School, right yeah. near the Detroit airport. Yeah, I was. I was so I was a Division three assistant for five years. Yep. I said where I played at Maranath and then at University of Wisconsin Whitewater, and I took the uh, job at Romulus for 11 years. So. I, I kind of feel like Detroit's my – I grew up in Wisconsin, but Detroit's kind of where my, I made my name in coaching. So we're, we're with you on the Detroit deal. You were there a few years before I was, though. Well, I'm a, I'm a shade younger. Uh, uh, older. Am I older than you or younger than you? A couple either years. One. Some, some year, days this year you felt older than me. Uh, but uh, <laughs> one of the things that I love – 13 years as a high school coach. And, you know, when you're a high school coach, you're doing God's work. Okay? What did you enjoy most about that? You know what, I enjoyed being with the kids every day because I, you know, all my players, I taught math, so I had three different math classes. You needed three math classes to uh, qualify for Division One, so we got them through Algebra <laughs> One, Geometry, and Statistics. So I had all my kids in class at some point. So just, and just the normal high school kids too, there's a lot of energy with high schoolers. So I actually miss the classroom a little bit. I don't miss any of the grading, paperwork, staff meetings, all that, can I forget all that. But like actually being in the classroom with the kids, I actually miss that a little bit. You're the only coach that I know that taught math. Does anyone else in this room teach math? Do you really? All smart guys, see? You all see? Four, all four of them. <laughs> you all should be in the front of the room. Yeah, you know, the smartest guys here. But, you know, hi, Lewis. Uh, but one of the things that, you know, and Nate has – grown as now a, a college coach, but we'll get to that about analytics. I want him to talk about that. But tell us how, as a fabulously successful high school coach, you end up going to college coaching. Yeah, so, and a lot of people ask me, and if I had some magic formula, I'd write a book and quit coaching because I'd make a lot of money. There's, there's no, you got to catch a lot of breaks, obviously. But, I mean, the story is D Danny Hurley, Recruited one of my kids, E.C. Matthews. He's top 100. D.C. ends up committing to Rhode Island the first fall. Danny had the job. Bobby was an assistant. You know, this kid wanted to be a point guard. And he kind of got their recruiting cycle going. The kid ended up being a really good player for Rhode Island. But then after the first year they coached, so E.C. committed before they ever coached a game. Then after their year one, Bobby got the job at Buffalo. And me and Danny talked that day. And me and Bobby – talked and Bobby hired me so that's that's the short version of it but that's you know me and Danny developed a relationship I took EC out there on an unofficial visit that's a long drive I drove him out I was big on making sure my guys got to see places they could go and I developed relationships with the coaches recruiting them and 
that's kind of how it happened. The Hurley family, dad, Bob Sr., Hall of Famer, uh, my first, I'm from Jersey, so my first job, he was a probation officer in beautiful Jersey City uh, and coach at St. Anthony's High School. My first job as a college coach, I haven't even officially graduated from college. I am hired as Dick Vitale's assistant at the University of Detroit. Yeah, we had a couple of Romulus players, but well, John Long. John Long I recruited yeah. from Romulus High School. That's why I know it so well. And so Dick says to me, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I don't ever recruit anyone. I haven't even graduated college. So he says, go back to Jersey and let's re go recruit guys. So I know like a lot of coaches in Jersey, but I'm like a player, a high school and college player, work their camps. First guy I go is my, see my friend, Bob Hurley. And, it, and we're, I'm in his little apartment in Jersey City. And he says, do me a favor, hold my kid. <laughs> and Bobby Hurley, the superstar Duke NBA player, is an infant. And then he says, hold it. Well, shit, he's lucky I didn't drop him, okay? <laughs> but, but uh, you know, talk about Bobby Hurley, one of the iconic point guards ever in college basketball. What was it like working and learning Yeah, from I mean, him? he's definitely intense. You can tell why, you know, because he's not that big, and he doesn't seem – he's more athletic than you'd think. But, he, uh, you know, he went through a little car crash. That's why he had his career in the NBA. But he's, he would still play. That was back – we played pickup some in the morning. He'd play with the guys, saw him. He's – look, he, he was – Great to work for, like 99% of the days, but he didn't take losing wealth. Like you, I think he's a little like his dad and his brother. Mm -hmm. The um, lose a couple in a row and things aren't that well around the office. So find out. But he, he's really, really intense. He, he's great at motivating. I actually learned a lot about how he just coached the point guards. I'd try to listen in as much as I could, and I did a lot of the recruiting for him, helped him with the coaching. But I learned a lot from him. I mean, he's he's intense. He's uh. He, he's smart when it comes to coaching point guards and what to look for and how to set stuff up and that type of stuff. And I enjoyed my two years with him. And shoot, I wouldn't be where I'm at if he didn't give me the job. I mean, and, and I'll say this, it was a little different because they respected high school coaches more than Danny came right from, you know, where he was St. Benedict's up to, right to Wagner. Right to Wagner. The dad was a Hall of Fame coach as a high school coach. So I was fortunate that a family that really respected high school coaches pulled me right out of the high school ranks. So when he goes to Arizona State around 2015, right, right yep. to take the job as head coach of Arizona State, I think this is the best part. How we talk about all this week, the number one thing here is jobs, right? I see every freaking assistant coach is running around here looking for jobs. Okay, I understand that, but how did your job search and Danny White, the AD yeah. there, how did his job search turn with you? Yeah, I mean, it was so, Bobby takes the job. I had, I, I couldn't, you know, I worked for Bobby. I couldn't exactly tell the administration everything I knew. I gave him as much as I could. Like, I said, look, it was out there that, I said, look, if he gets offered a job, he's probably going to take it. I knew he was going to take it. So they were, I kind of let them know enough. So they, as soon as it was going to be announced, Bobby had to do this whole meeting with the team on a, Speaker phone. I pulled the whole team together. I gave him 30 minutes so it needed. So they were all up in Bobby's office at the time, and I had him on speaker phone. He kind of let the team know that was not the easiest way to do it. I was glad when Greg Byrne hired me at Alabama, he let me go in <laughs> and speak to the team, which right. was much better in person to do it. But anyway, so they they had it. So Danny White took the whole team into one one room. I went with the associate AD to another spot. Danny said, "You might, you know, do you want to be the name the interim?" coach I said yeah he said would you like to interview for the job I said yes and he said how long will it take to be ready I said well if you need me to get a whole PowerPoint together I'll be ready tomorrow if you just want to talk I'm ready right now so he met with the team for 30 minutes the team gave them the feedback and I, I didn't I did not go through the whole deal of telling the team to tell him like no like that to me that backfires yeah. let the team speak say what they want but I'd recruited a lot of them we had to it helped. We had the conference player of the year coming back that had played for me in high school. So that, that wasn't the worst thing. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. That's good. But a lot of the players were like, you know, if you keep Coach Oates, like, we're staying. So, you know, but, but again, if you corner an AD, if you back him into a corner, that's not good. And I, so I never told the players what to say. And, they, and I didn't want Danny to feel that way. I wanted him to hire me because I was the best guy for the job and could keep the team together and keep the momentum rolling. So we talked for a long time that first night. It was a Thursday night. I came in the next day. We met 
for a large part of the next day, Friday. I came in the next day, Saturday, and he, and he wanted, I'd been a college coach for two years, so he wanted, if he was going to give me the job, he wanted a large say in what the assistant looked like. So he, gave, he didn't tell me who to hire, but he wanted, a, wanted somebody with former Division I experience. You know, he liked the fact that Bobby had a big name, helped with recruited, so it would be good if I had a former NBA player maybe on staff and then kind of whoever I wanted for the third guy. So by Saturday morning, I had, had Jim Whitesell flying in, associate head coach. He'd been at St. John's, been a head coach at Loyola. So I kind of, this is a former head coach. I'd known Jim a little bit. So I, I kind of sat on with him. Sat, I'm like, look, I don't have the job. This is a little bit different. I'm flying Whitesell in. I'm not the head coach. Kind of like, well, where do we go? Like, so we met Saturday morning, and that's kind of when he said, listen, I'm going to offer you the job. So don't, you don't have to hire Jim if you don't want, you know, but it, it's good. I'm, so we went through it. So it went from like Thursday evening through Saturday morning. He decided he was going to give me the job, so less than 48 hours later. So I, I, Danny, who's now the AD at Tennessee, Danny was replaced by Alan Green. He was the deputy AD when I got the job. Danny and Alan were good. Alan's now the AD at Auburn. Right. So I've got two, two of my former bosses in our league. But, <laughs> you know, D Danny was good. I mean, Danny, to hire a guy that only had two years' experience in Division One, he showed some, you know, he, he – it took a lot for Danny to make the hire, but it looks good. It looks good now, I think. Yeah. yeah. So going 18 inches over from the college assistant now to a college head coach in a very good league, the MAC conference. What was that like for you? I mean, and we talked about that, me and Danny, in the interview. It was, I had been a head coach in high school for 11 years, so there's there's a learning curve no matter what jobs you you take. I felt the learning curve from being a. I had already had a lot of head coaching experience. I mean. Mm -hmm. Summer league, I, like I don't know, count everything together. Probably 400 games as a head coach, you'd had to make decisions. And I felt like that that learning curve was less than a guy that's never been a head coach before, that's maybe been in Division One his whole life and only been an assistant. Right. So my learning curve was more. I've been a head coach. I'm. I'm. Gonna, I know how to be a head coach, but how to deal with the extra stuff outside of being a head coach at the Division One level. All the, the recruiting, running a program, more people under you, all that type of stuff. But actually running a practice, coaching a team in a game, I've done that. Like, And I, I felt pretty confident in my abilities to do that. And I think the learning curve was more on all the other stuff that came with being a head coach. So in your years now at uh, Buffalo, incredible success. Your team is really good. You get even a couple of contract extensions. Yeah. Including one like two weeks before you go to Alabama. Yeah, 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 right? we did. So <laughs> after year one, they, they, I was the lowest paid coach in the league when Danny first hired me. I didn't care. Like I was a high school coach two years ago. Just <laughs> give me a chance. Give me the job. Right. I really didn't care what they paid me. So he made me the lowest paid coach in the league, which is fine. He gave me a chance. After year one, we went to the NCAA tournament. They gave me an, a raise, an extension. That was, so then after year two, year two is the only time. Only time in uh, Division One coaching I haven't been in the NCAA tournament when they've had it was my second year at Buffalo. So nothing happened there. Year three, we kind of hit it out of the park, beat Arizona, gave me another one. Then they gave me another one at the end of year four. But I told them that we made it up to 14th in the country. I said, don't give me a raise and extension based on us repeating this year because this may never happen again. So they, but they, you know, they, they put something good down in it. You know, I, Division One's, I mean, you've been in it, it's hard business like contracts and all that. So they gave me a good raise after year four, but I, they knew there was a chance I could still leave. But the, the buyout went up, so it actually worked in their favor. They got more money when I got the Alabama job. I, I, there was a chance I was going to leave, but if I stayed, I was going to be fairly well compensated. And they, they were going to get more money if I left too because they, they made the buyout go up. So it, wor it worked in both parts. I'm trying to hit as many topics for you guys as possible. What's it like when you leave a team you really like? That was hard. Yeah. Look, I interviewed it couple different spots after my third year and I had a lot of guys coming back I didn't really want to leave I'll say this I didn't want to leave after my fourth year at Buffalo we loved Buffalo my family liked it my oldest daughter was a freshman in uh, high school it's a hard time to move them but so I made two calls the night before we landed my last my last year at Buffalo we lost to Texas Tech on a Sunday in the second round we, we played Arizona State in the first round it was a little awkward having to play Bobby <laughs> But uh, we lose to Texas Tech. We land on Monday. There was a uh, voicemail from Greg Byrne, the AD at Alabama. So we uh, end up calling him back. We set up an interview. That was on Monday. I called him back. So we set up an interview for uh, Tuesday evening. 
So the next day, so Monday night, I got a hold of two people. I called Mark Few at Gonzaga, and I called Brad Stevens. He was nice enough to take my call. I had, we're on a road trip in the NBA, and they, they had an off night. So I really wanted those two guys to talk me into staying at Buffalo because <laughs> Mark had stayed at Gonzaga when they were kind of more mid-major and built it up. You know, everybody in Buffalo was like, let's build it up to the next Gonzaga. <laughs> and then Brad had turned down plenty of high-major jobs to stay at Butler, and they were a mid-major at the time. I don't know if you'd call them that anymore in the Big East. but <laughs> So after I got off the phone with both of them, I kind of became more convinced I needed to take the job at Alabama if I could get it. So <laughs> they, they didn't really talk me into staying. Did they, the opposite. <laughs> yeah, I, it was just different scenarios. Gonzaga was at a way different spot than Buffalo was after his – fourth year at Gonzaga and you know Brad said if he did come back into college he'd go back where there was where it was a football school there's a lot of money there's he'd kind of work behind the scenes it wasn't a ton of pressure just past it, there was a lot of stuff they both said that I I, I, I went after the Alabama job as hard as I could get and I ended up obviously I got it so coaches are you looking to take your game preparation to the next level then fast model sports is the perfect coaching software for you with FastDraw, build an organized library of plays and drills and create professional playbooks to share with your players and staff. You can also download over 9,500 free plays and drills from our play bank directly to your FastDraw account. Looking for a better way to build your scouting reports and want to include video? With FastScout, build custom scouting report templates to prepare your team best for each individual opponent. Plus, did you know with the latest... Updates from Fast Model Sports. You can now include video with your Fast Scout reports and share with your coaches and staff all within the Fast Scout mobile app. The combination of Fast Draw and Fast Scout is by far the best way for you and your coaches to create winning game strategies and effectively communicate them to your team. Over 10,000 high school and youth coaches trust Fast Model Sports products to help their teams reach their goals. To order, Go to FastModelSports.com. Use code COACHINGU15 to get 15% off any Fast Draw or Fast Scout products. Remember, go to FastModelSports.com. Use code COACHINGU15 to get 15% off any Fast Draw and Fast Scout products. So when you go down there, uh, you know, they've been fairly successful. I had a bad year kind of thing before that, and as it, in the SEC, it, they're not hesitant or shy to make changes, uh, as they are in football also. Uh, what was it like going from the MAC to the SEC? Yeah, so there were six coaches in the SEC when I got the job that had coached in a Final Four. So <laughs> they're, they're, the coaching ranks was good. The players – We've had more players come out of the NBA since I've been in the SEC than I think any other league or come out of the league into the NBA. There's The talent level's high. The coaching was high. There's no real off nights, as evidenced by us this year. I mean, we beat – there was four Sweet 16 teams that we played this year, and we were 4-0 and against them. There was three Elite 8 teams. We were 3-0 and against them. But then we lose to the last place team in the league, Georgia. We lose to – Missouri, we lose to Mississippi State. All three of those coaches lost their jobs after the year, and we, we lost all of them. So we had some of the best wins in the country, but then, the, shoot, on the road in the SEC is not easy. So I get there. We had to – you know, we, 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 want, we have a style we play. Obviously, we play fast. We take a lot of threes. The combination of those two, we may do better than any other high major team, and we, we were turning that way at Buffalo for sure. We wanted to put our system in. The roster we had did not fit our system. We put the system in anyways because in recruiting, everybody, almost everybody, there's a few honest guys out there, get their press conference and say they're going to play fast. And then you pull up Ken Palm when you're recruiting against them and they're like 300 and something in the country. In tempo, yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> that's not that fast. There's, you know, 358 teams and they're 330th in tempo. We're, you know, 11th this year or whatever we were. So, we, we wanted to put our style in no matter what the roster was, and we did. And we ended up one game over 500, and we knew that we didn't really have it. So the transfer portal, everybody complains about it. I don't really think it's that bad, to be honest with you. It's, it's a quicker, easier way to turn the roster over the way you want it to be. You know, you can do right by your players because they don't have to sit. If you've got players on your roster and they need to be somewhere else to play more, but let's 
to encourage you to get in a portal and see what's out there. They don't have to sit. It's good for them, and then you can bring some guys in. So we got the roster flipped the way we wanted it to between year one and year two, and obviously kind of hit it out of the park in year two. But I think putting the system in out of the gate and showing, no, we're going to play this way. This is the way we play, period. And obviously you adjust for your personnel. You tweak it within the system, but we're not going to completely change systems based on personnel. So I, I live in Baton Rouge. It's up the road, and I'm driving one night, one afternoon. I'm driving uh, the day after they lost to Georgia, which was a really rough loss. And he had made a commitment, if I'm not mistaken, to t- go on Paul Feinbaum's <laughs> yeah. show, which nationally is heard on ESPNU and on TV, mm-hmm. but in the South, it's the number one sports show. And I'm driving at that time, and I said, oh, shit, he's coming on this show after that game. <laughs> and I, I tell you what, I thought it was the best radio I maybe I've ever heard because there was none of that coach speak shit. I mean, this was real stuff. And he's an analytics you have a great reputation as a, as a basketball coach, as an analytics guy. But you said one thing in that. You had a meeting afterwards. You said, uh, Paul said, asked you about analytics. And you said, I have to not rethink this, but I, I spent more time last night on what subject? Well, like motivation. Like, how do you motivate your team? Like, like, in, like chemistry. I, the analytics is great. I'm, I'm all into it. I'm a math guy. And I'm <laughs> I, like, we're going to get the best efficiency numbers we can and all. It doesn't matter if your players aren't playing hard and for for each other and together. Like uh, all you, get, there's teams in our league that are like very analytically. Um, I don't know how you say it. Poor, <laughs> like they they take low efficient shots, but they motivate their guys to play ridiculously hard. And they, it doesn't really matter what their first shot is it's because they play so hard in their second shot. They get so many second shots. It doesn't matter if the first shot's the worst shot in the game of basketball. They're guys, they got the best athletes, and they're motivating them to play hard, and they just go get the second one in their offensive rebound. And to be honest with you, out of the three years I've been at Alabama, this was our most efficient offense this year. We are 16th in the country, only because our offensive rebound rate was so high, because we weren't great a lot of the other stuff. I mean, we took higher efficiency shots. We just didn't make threes, and we had too many turnovers. But we did get to the offensive board. So there's a lot that goes into being a good team, but – Playing together, motivating the team, and being ready to play every night, uh, that that's number one in my opinion. Psychology, you said on that, yeah. was almost more important. And the other thing that impressed me was, you know, to coach at any level, you have to be truthful with your people, to yourself, et cetera. And what did you do post-game with your team that night? I didn't enjoy really what talk. Had, what, I yeah. came in, usually you're standing up in front of the team, and they're – Staff met for a while. It was a bad loss, so you didn't walk right into the team. And I, you know, and I don't think it's. I'm not a big guy and go in and let all my emotions out on the team. That doesn't usually go over well. I try to not say too much, but that time I walked in, took a chair, sat down, in front of them, like you guys talk. What just happened? Like, how, they, and no disrespect to Georgia, but they mm. were one in seventeen in the eighteen SEC games. We were their one win. Okay, so now they were close. They almost beat Auburn, who was number one in the country at one time. So yeah. the, 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 the margins are, are slim, and the difference between winning and losing is slim. And they, they almost beat some teams, but they didn't. They were 1-17, and we were their one win. And it was later in the year to where they were 0-whatever before we walked in there, 0-9, 0-10, 0 somewhere in there. So I said, you guys tell me what happened. There was some real, you know, and it, guys talked around guys for a minute and then some assistants and all, like, say it. <laughs> like, who are you talking about? Like, what, what are you talking, you know, like, sometimes some of that stuff's got to get out. And, and you know, at, we had some good wins after that, but it, it was a little up and down, and I think your internal leadership of your team, if you don't have great internal leadership, it's hard to consistently play at a high level. You're going to get them up, you're going to – but they – the best teams are player coach teams. And if you got great leaders – they can get their teammates to, to play at this level all the time. When we're having to motivate them as a coach every single night out, it ends up a little bit more like this, in my opinion. I agree. You work with, at Alabama, the greatest football coach of all time, Nick Saban. What have you learned from him? The attention to detail is ridiculous. Like, like so I, I, I got there, you know, he, I met him before the press conference. We met. 
a little bit there. But then I, I had to get a staff, get a team, everything. We're going full bore. When everything slowed down, our guys left for summer school. Camp opens up in August. You know, our guys left after summer school. So we had a couple weeks off without our play. I went to a lot of practices. I asked if I could go on their first road trip. So they played uh, Duke in Atlanta on a neutral for the first game of the year. I went with them. I went and sat in all the meetings. I shattered them for a full day. They, uh, the, the, the thing that probably I remember most is their Friday practice before the Saturday game, they went through – I can't imagine there's many more scenarios in a football game than they went through. I mean, just every possible scenario you could think of, they walked through. And I'm trying to equate it – like, what's the basketball equivalent to this? I think in basketball there's there's more – and it'd be hard to go through every one because it's been the whole practice. And, but just, well, let's at least think through them all. So then we actually had a former NBA, Dean Cooper, I don't know if you know him, came sure. in. We walked through all kinds of end of game. We spent three days on end of game situation stuff as a staff. And then, and it actually, I don't know if, how many of you follow everything. One of them came up. You know, a lot of that stuff you go through and it never comes up. But you better be prepared for it if it does come up. So it, we were at South Carolina, up three. They called timeout underneath out of bounds. They needed a three with under five seconds. And we had said, look, if, if it comes up, we're doing this whole, call it like an umbrella. Like you just basically put five guys around the three-point arc and play a five-out zone with nobody inside the three. We didn't guard a man anywhere. And Charlie Henry, my assistant that runs the defense, like, you want to do it? I said, yeah. He's like, are you sure? Because obviously <laughs> if it backfires, you're going to look really stupid. I was like, no, we said we're going to do it. Like what we agreed on, you know, yeah. before the season. So we do it. South Carolina comes out and throw the ball right to their player for a layup. So now they're down one, but we inbound the ball right away. They didn't have anybody to – we inbound it. They followed us. There's like one second on the clock. The game's essentially over. So, I, you know, it's different scenarios like yeah. that. I just – Saban's attention to detail is so good. And then he runs – I mean, they got so many analysts and everything. I walked into the first staff meeting. I counted, I think – 54 people in the staff meet like I have no idea what everybody does when I walked into my first meeting at Alabama there was I mean it was me three assistants and an ops guy at, at Buffalo I walked in there's 20 people I like what in the world are we all doing in here well on football it's a whole different like yeah. level so just organization how to run a an entire program attention to DT he's I mean he's good at a lot of things he gets the best players in the country yeah. And motivates him to play really hard, but there, there's there's a lot of other stuff he does really well too. That's fabulous. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna allow you and with each speaker to ask some questions. So uh, Zach, just raise your hand if you have a question for Nate. And now this is the interactive part. This is for you. Who has a question? Just raise your hand. We'll bring you a microphone. Well, I'll, I'll, here, I'll repeat it. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned Coach Hurley learned like what to look for in point guards for him. Yeah. What, what does Coach Early look for in point guards? And what I look, I, I, I actually one of our best point guards we had in Lamonte Beard and I recruited. I had sent him to send. I mean, he, Hurley obviously with him being tough would like some toughness. But he, I think, the way they see the floor, can you make the reads? You're almost like a quarterback making the reads. You know, A, B, C. The other thing is, if you really want to throw it here, a good quarterback isn't staring his receiver down the wall and Hurley would get in and like demonstrate like you want to put the ball here well it would help if you looked here and know you're throwing it here kind of look the defense saw he Hurley was great at it I wasn't really a point guard when I played I played division three I still can't demonstrate it as well but some of the stuff he setting up you know where you want it to go I want to get Christian Leitner the ball well I'm not going to stare Christian Leitner down I'm a look 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 and then hit him last minute just some of the high and Again, like, he, he ran the team. Like, Leitner was a leader. Bobby had stories, though, like, no, like, I'm the point guard. I'm going to get you the ball when, when you need the ball, not when you think you need the ball. Like, I know when you need the ball. Like, some of the stories you told on some of that stuff, just – and that's not natural either. And, and I'm going to be honest with you, I haven't done the best job coaching some of the point guards to be, like, the leader that Bobby maybe could do it because he kind of played it and was a little different. But I, I do think it's important. Go ahead. Go ahead. Good to see you, man. When you mentioned uh, these player-led teams and the internal leadership, when you go through the recruiting process, how It's a good question because we've talked about this a lot as a staff. So he asked player-led internal leadership when you go through the recruiting process, how well. 
it, it, I don't want to say it's impossible. It's very hard, though. So you got to get a little fortunate because all the high school coach, I was a high school coach for 11 years. High school coach is going to tell you what they think you want to hear to take their kid for the most part. That's why it's great to have real relationships where they're not going to lie. Like I'm finding it now, and the, M- the NBA wants real relationships right. with us, so we tell them the truth. I would love to have real relationships with the high school coaches so they tell me the truth. But I I tried to tell the truth as much as I could as a high school coach, but I was never going to kill a kid. Like, that's not my job. So it, it's very hard, but there's certain red flags that come up. The kid doesn't want to work. You go to a game. You watch a game and watch their interaction. I mean, if they're not talking to their teammates, they're not a leader. The high school coach could tell me whatever he wants. When I go watch the game, if he's not huddling them up, if he's not in his teammate's ear, when he's on the bench, if he's not talking to his teammates on the bench, how does he get coached? How does he interact with the coaches? That's the stuff you can look at because you're not going to get 100% truth because everybody wants their kids to go to high level, highest. And was, for all you high school coaches, I just said something to, the other day to some one of my former assistants. If I had it to do over again as a high school coach, I don't think you push your kids to the highest level they can go. I don't think it does them a sur- uh, I think it's a disservice at times. I think you push them to where they can be most successful because as you see it, they go higher than what they should go, then they have to come back down and they wasted years up here. But like find them the now, the difference between D three and D two having to pay forty thousand and getting a full ride at a D two or whatever, if you can get them into a D two, obviously that's a difference. But trying to push a D two guy into a low D one, a mid major guy into a high major, that's probably not the smartest move. And I did a little bit of that as a high school coach. Just trying, it makes makes me look better. A little Maya you go in it if my kids go here. Like as a younger guy, the longer I went in high school, the less I did that. And I, if I had, if I went back to high school now, I would try to never do that. Let's just find him the best spot for him to be the most successful he can be. That's good. Yes, sir. The most impactful part of my development as a coach, I still think it's relationships with the players. And I, I would my my journey's a lot different than anybody else that's at the Division One level, at the high major level as a head coach. Most of them didn't coach D three in high school, and but relationships with the players, it's hard to motivate the players. And, and that's where I feel like maybe I didn't do as good a job as I should have this year. I tried, I worked harder maybe this year than any other year in building these relate, but. They were harder guys to build relationships with, so I needed to work even harder than what I did. And if you don't have a good relationship with the players to where they trust you and they feel like you've got their best interests, I really don't care how much basket – like, you know, not to sound arrogant, but I feel like I've got a pretty good grasp on what I want to do X and O-wise. But if the players aren't 100% bought in and don't believe that you got their best interests and you don't have a relationship with them to to, to do it, all that stuff doesn't matter. And that, that goes from high school JV to – to the NBA, probably really. I haven't sure. coached at that level. He has, but you know. So I, I think the most impactful part as a high school coach, we used to take our team to, we used to take them to church camps to get to kind of bond. We took them up to the UP. We'd take them to a. My buddy owns the biggest dairy farm in the UP. We went up there and camped out for three days, two nights, just get to get away, get to get these kids out of Detroit had never been. You did that uh, to those boys at Romulus. I oh, did. They, I got videos. They're riding oh. pigs around and stuff. But you just kind of <laughs> did some fun stuff. about them twelve brothers the riding the. Yeah, yeah I, I, love, I didn't I love coach it. any white kids in my eleven years at <laughs> Romulus. So, yeah, it was it was good. It was a good group though. Anyone else? Yes. So the, he asked physical attributes when we're recruiting. What do we look at? So with wh- how we play, we look, we like to play four guards a lot. You can't play four guards if they're all six one, six two. So we need we need. So now they don't all have to be like Quinterly was really good for us. Could get in the paint, break down a defense. Where we spread the floor. So you got to have a combination of a little bit of everything. But like with how we play, our fives either got to be we play fast. They got they have to be able to run the floor. But they either got to be rim running, Clint Capella, tight Rudy Gobert, whatever, or they got to be pick and pop to keep the floor space, and we can slash a you know a perimeter guy in there. So got a certain thing we're looking for in fives. We need, and we missed them this year a lot. Primo, shoot, I watched Sports Center this morning. Yeah. Back-to-back highlights. Herb <laughs> Jones blocking LeBron shot. The next game they showed highlights of, Primo's getting a dunk. Well, those two guys were on our team last year. Those are 6'8 guards and 6'6 six, six guards. We didn't have enough of those this year. So when you put four guards on the floor and they're 6'1", 6'2", 6'3", 6'4", 170 pounds at the four, like that, it doesn't work very well. 
It worked a lot better last year when Herb Jones is 6'8", and Primo's 6'6", 205. You know, you can play those guys one, two, three, four. So we need some long athletic guards that can play the three, four. When I mean, we started three point guards at Buffalo one year. We're trying to recruit more combo guards, point guards right now out of the portal, and they're looking at our roster. I'm like, no, like, trust me, <laughs> we're going to play you. Yeah. Like, we don't play one point guard. Yeah. It's not football where you play one quarterback. Yeah. We can put three point guards on the floor together and be just fine. So, But we need some of them to be a little bigger, longer, more athletic. And to be honest with you, no disrespect to some of the guys I had, and it's more on the coaching staff. Our player development's got to get a little better, and we put a huge point emphasis. We got to have outside of the five, we'd like all of our guys to be able to pass, dribble, and shoot. We didn't feel like we had enough guys that could pass, dribble, and shoot. He can only shoot. He can pass, but he can't dribble or shoot. We want guys that can pass, dribble, and shoot, unless they're a seven-foot center or a spacing 6'10 guy that can really shoot. That's good. Last question. I got to go. Yes, Jonathan. Oh, shoot. That's a, that's a tough question. He asked, what did I sacrifice to get where I'm at? Like, and I, I'm, I, like I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. Like, but, like, I spent way – I'm going to tell you this right now. I spent way too much time away from my family when I was a high school coach when I had to do everything, being there at 6 a.m. to run workouts all the way through. You know, it, it's – I feel, and I took my, I got three daughters. I took my oldest a lot with me, but even now I just, I missed my daughter's prom last night. Like, uh, like, I don't like that. I got pictures. I told her, let's get you dressed up and we'll take a picture with me when I get back. But there was, I, I didn't, I did a bad job on my calendar. I didn't realize it was the same weekend. I didn't know it was her prom until a few weeks ago. It wasn't on my calendar. And, you know, in hindsight, maybe I should have passed up on the final four if I'd have known, but I'd committed to stuff. I'd been here, but there's, there's a few things there. I try to be as best dad I can, but like, I, I, there's no way I could have kept doing what I did at Romulus for those 11 years, f forever. Like I, I was away, I did it did too much. But like sometimes, and there's certain I, I've learned there's seasons in life too. Like like sometimes during the season you got to sacrifice some stuff, but then when you get done with the season, you better make sure there's time for your family. Like take time away. And I think some coaches, myself included, for for a lot, large part of it, like think that. Like you, you, some of the work is not necessary sometimes. Like, like, and it's more, it'd be better if you kept a, a great family life at, again, there's seasons to everything. Get done with the season. Like, like we get home from the final four. I'm, I'm not missing any of my daughters. She's a senior in high school. I didn't miss, during COVID was great. I didn't miss one volleyball game the whole time she played. She's not going to play in college. So I, she's in soccer now. I, like if it's my daughter's soccer game or a recruiting trip, I'm gonna go to her soccer game this spring. So like I got two 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 daughters behind her. Like I'm gonna be at as much stuff as I can. Like it's to me a recruiting trip that that maybe could go, maybe couldn't go. You could send an assistant. Like the more stuff like that that you could maybe be a better dad, husband, whatever. I just think there's there's a little bit of that that maybe I had to sacrifice to get where I'm at. But I again you can't. There's a balance. I couldn't go to all their games and not recruit, or I ain't gonna have any players. So like, we can't do that either. You get fired. But there's got to be a little bit of balance where I feel like maybe sometimes in my past, I, the balance wasn't as balanced as it maybe should have been. If I don't know if that's a good answer to your question or not, but he he's got three within two years, three little babies. Well, I had an assistant that came. He was my assistant in Ramos for nine years. He's my point guard in college. They had two sets of twins. He had five. Under two years, so you had his first, had then had two. Wins. Ten that's months later, bad. and then a year later, had two. That's not he had bad. he had to take a year off coaching. He won a bunch of state championships at Michigan, but he he, he was smart. Took a year off coaching to help. <laughs> but yeah, was well, not easy. It, Adam, last one, brother. It's a lot harder. I went to, you know, I, I I like to go to church every Sunday morning. We had 
practices uh, Sunday morning when I was an assistant at Buffalo sometimes, you know, like Hurley's a big NFL guy, likes to go and watch the game. So, I, you know, I said something to him once about I'd like to go with my family. But, you know, he makes a decision. He can choose to move back or not. I have to be at practice. I work for him. That's I don't have an option. So, and Hurley was great to work for, like really good. Like I loved working for him. But, you know, I just, like I didn't have – as a, as a head coach, I can put practice at 1 o'clock on a Sunday if I want, and I can go, choose to go to church. As an assistant, I didn't have that option. I had to show up. But as I, as a head coach now, and I've got two of my assistants are married with kids, and, you know, one of them didn't come down here. He spent time at home with this guy. I told him, yeah, stay. Like, there's no sense. You don't need to be down here with some of this stuff. We went through a long year. You know, the other one, they, they'll ask me, hey, coach, you mind if I go to my daughter's this or that? I, I, try, I try, first off, I'm not missing my daughter's games if I'm in town. So we practice during the day in college. You don't have to practice five to eight or four to seven. We practice in the morning or around lunchtime, depending on semesters and schedules, so that I can get out and go to all my kids' stuff. But same with my assistants. If you need to get out, get out. Go like if you want to leave during the day for any of your kids' stuff. Like I, if you want to bring your kids into the office, like I'm more get your work done. You don't have. To you can take your laptop home and watch video as well as you can watch at the office. Your cell phone works just as well at your house as it does at the office. Like if that's what you're doing recruiting, just get your work done. So I'm big on giving, making sure they have time to. I've got a strength spot open. I interviewed a guy and he asked about that. I'm like, shoot, bring your kids in. Like I, I don't care as long as it's professional and they get their work done. So I do think as assistants, if you're if you are a family guy, because there's horror stories from some guys that have worked for different guys. They're they required to be in the office till the head coach. I don't do that either. There's some days where I do have to stay up there. I've got functions at like go home, like get out, like you don't have to wait till I leave. Like I'm not looking at your house. Like I'm looking to see, make sure you get your work done. So I would, for all you assistants looking to work for head coaches, if if that stuff's if you're single, you've got a lot of options. You can go work for whoever you want. If you're a family with kids, you should probably look really hard at how the head coaches. Maybe talk to some assistants that have worked for that guy before to see how they handle some of that stuff. Fabulous stuff. Can't thank Nate enough. Let's give him a big hand. Appreciate it. Thank, so thanks, fellas. Appreciate you guys. Thanks. Appreciate you, different. Brendan. I told you you'd love it. Nate Oates is the deal. I mean, we did 35 minutes, and I told him afterwards we could have done two hours. Uh, I just enjoy him. The thing I love about him is I love to learn from him, and I th hope you enjoyed the same thing. Just a reminder that in Las Vegas, uh, July 9 and 10, you'll be able to come to our Coaching You Live VIP experience that is just one of the great clinics in all of basketball because it's 90%, I'm going to use that word, 90% NBA coaches. So you'll have the very best and brightest of them, plus Editor A. Messina, I think the best coach in the world outside the NBA, used to be an NBA associate head coach with Pop in San Antonio, Coach Kobe with the Lakers. But Ettore is going to come. He's a great coach in Milan right now. And then the incredible John Gordon, one of the most gifted authors and team builders that there is in sports today, speaks to every great professional and college team there is, as well as to corporations all over the world. John has, once again, I think it's his fourth or fifth appearance at Coaching U, and he's going to come and share his newest insights. And this is a guy that last, you know, has worked with the LA Rams, the LA Dodgers, and countless other teams, uh, Clemson football. I just think you're really going to enjoy him. I do every time I learn from him. So again, July 9 and 10 for our Coaching You Live VIP experience. And then on the 11th and 12th, Monday and Tuesday, first time ever in Vegas, our front office training camp, where for those of you that want to get into a professional basketball front office, from scouting to basketball development to video, to be a scout general manager, whatever your heart desires, we have the best people in the NBA coming in the G League from Europe coming to teach you. And so there's nothing like it. I'm simply the facilitator for it. And we have done this before with only NBA players. It is off the charts. So please go to coachingyoulive.com forward slash 2022. Coachingyoulive forward slash coachingyoulive.com forward slash 2022. And you can get all the info you need.
So I look forward to seeing you in July, but get Coaching You Plus so that you can learn every day. Till next week, this is the coach, Brendan Sir. Thank you.